welcome to the Eat Stay Love podcast. I'm so glad you're here. I'm Wendy Poishbeg, and today I'm talking with TJ Worth, owner and operator of Top Shelf Cannabis. I have to admit, I had a lot of fun during this interview. I was mostly deer in the headlights as I'm trying to wrap my head around TJ's ganja preneur journey. I mean, he starts with just a few medicinal marijuana plants, and now he's grown that to a big CBD line. We talked a little bit about the new vape concerns and the intricacies and the rules and regulations that guide the cannabis industry. I mean, I have to admit our conversation sometimes went off the rails, but mostly you'll hear that TJ is a very sweet guy with a passion for all things weed. Okay, here we go. This is TJ Worth of Top Shelf Cannabis on the Eat Stay Love podcast. We already getting high in high school. Um, she, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I started smoking weed when I was ten years old. Come on. Yeah. yeah. Really? Yeah. With the guy down the way, he, um, this guy, what was he? Uh, he was a couple years older than me, John Schaefer, and uh, God rest his soul. And oh. uh, but he had uh, open heart surgery when he was a baby. And he had the scar going right here, and he used to see his his part, heart pumping like this, boom, boom, boom. And that dude didn't give a, a nothing about nothing, right? And because he was told he was going to die when he was eighteen, and uh, and so he was just a heck of a wild friend to <laughs> hang around, you know. And he always had weed, and he lived with his grandma, and uh, he called her nanny. Yeah. And uh, once in a while, he'd get nanny to smoke some, you know. And um, and we, used to, you know, he just go over there after school, and like I said, kids ran loose. Uh, there were six kids in my family, and you know, you, you came home at six o'clock for dinner, and uh, yeah, you knew where you yeah, had to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's the thing is that a ten-year-old could buy weed, right? And a, and a ten-year-old could go get a bag of weed for ten bucks. And uh, the thing is, is that uh, with regulation and all this, it, it's much harder. And, and even if the ten-year-old could get some weed, he maybe get his big brother or somebody to get it for him. It came from the store. It was tested, right? And uh, it's not poison. I remember when I was a kid, we were watching a TV. I think it was in eighth grade. And there was a news, you know, we're watching. And uh, they were talking about Paraquat. And they were going to, uh, fl- they flew over the Mexican uh, fields and they sprayed the Paraquat, which is a brand name of some herbicide, right? Like Roundup. And, uh, whoosh, you know, and so, you know, I didn't think much of it. About three weeks later, you know, you buy a quarter ounce of weed from the guy, you know, and hey, but and you're smoking it. And you get this horrible, you know, burning in your throat, you know. <laughs> you know, and you're like, and he's like, yeah, that's paraquat, you know. And you're like, oh, well, you know, you can't throw it away, it's, you know. Uh, you know. <laughs> so, you know, this thing that's going on now, once again, that was weed that was grown in Mexico. Nobody cares. The farmers don't care about the people in Seattle and the smokers in Seattle and blah, blah, blah. They don't care if anybody lives or dies, right? They're getting paid. They're black market farmers in another country. And so, um, you know, they just, they have a crop and they need to get paid for it. <laughs> so, uh, you know, and the same thing that's happening right now uh, is uh, black market poison being imported from China, right? Yeah, and, I've been hearing about yeah, that. Yeah, and the Chinese are helping the black marketeers down there, right? Uh, so you could take a, a legitimate brand, right, and say, you know, say it was top shelf, God forbid, right? But say one of my products and then give it to the Chinese, and then they would counterfeit it completely and give it back to you and make one of these traps that we talked about earlier, yep. right? And, yep. and there you go, and then they'd sell it on the street, and, and somebody could get killed, right? And so it took them seven weeks to get back to the – they found these guys in L.A. They were college kids or whatever, and they were making all this stuff, but it took them seven weeks to find them. But they found them. I just uh, read the story this morning, as a matter of fact, and uh, – Wait, you, you found out about seven weeks ago a Chinese manufacturer had already taken somebody's brand? No, they. Uh, you heard about the vape crisis right now. Yeah, I did. Right. So they investigated. They said, people are dying. Oh, my God, what do we do? They sent some investigative crack team on it, and they track it back. Bad cartridge. Where'd it come from? Where'd it come from? Where'd it come from? Bam, ba, da, da, ba, da, bam. Seven weeks later, they end up in a condo in Los Angeles with college kids making selling 5,000 carts a day of illegal poison carts, right? Yeah, boom, yeah. out in the black market. Boom, 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 right? And they found them, put them down, right? But but look, you know, that's the black market. Legitimate, you know, people, they can't do that, right? They're tested by laboratories, third market laboratories. So I want to get kind of get started here. I yep. want to introduce you. This is TJ Worth from Top Shelf Cannabis. How's it going? It's going good, and nice. I appreciate you being yeah. here. Thanks for having me. 
So I'm not a pot smoker. I'm not a CBD user. <laughs> and I want you to educate me on your ganjapreneur mm -hmm. ju journey. And sure. uh, let's start from the top. So how did you get started? And we know we you may have gotten started in the 10th grade, but let's talk <laughs> about top shelf. Right, right. So, um, you know, I, I, come from, I was an engineer, worked in a cube, uh, spent 45 minutes each day going 8.3 miles one way, you know, and uh, one of those mornings I was listening to NPR, a fine radio station, <laughs> and uh, listened to maybe something like this, you know, and people were talking about medical marijuana. And I was like, da, 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 you know, and, uh, and I thought, well, you know, um, and at the time I had a qualifying condition. I was, uh, I had a hepatitis C, but since then I've been you know, cured of that by Harvoni. Thank you, Harvoni. And uh, what is Harvoni? It's just a medicine that people came up with. Uh, you know, big pharma came up with to cure hepatitis C. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So uh, very nice of them. And uh, at first, they denied me. They said I was too healthy. But uh, after a year later, and somebody sued them because it was a hundred thousand dollars worth of medicine uh, to cure you, and they said, "Well, you're not sick enough." You know. <laughs> you didn't have glaucoma. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, <laughs> so wrong I, ailment, man. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> anyway, I had a qualifying condition, and uh, I went and got a green card, and uh, and then I was worried for a couple months uh, because uh, I'm an alcoholic, and uh, so I was worried that if I would start growing weed, it would jump out and get me, you know, yeah. and I might start wanting to, you know, smoke it, and and then then I would get thirsty, and then I would die, right? And I didn't really necessarily want to die. I just want to grow some weed. <laughs> and uh, and the reason why was because right as I was tooling down a road like that, I was thinking about a diagnosis that my son had got uh, for autism. And uh, and I just uh, got some therapy uh, quoted to me for $34,000. And my take-home <laughs> pay was about fifty eight, you know. And so I was like, well, you know, 50% of my pay on therapy. Blah, blah, blah. And so all these thoughts are going through my head. And then the NPR guy comes on and says, medical marijuana, blah, blah, blah. And I said, dang, I can grow weed. You know, I grew weed when I was a kid. And, and uh Usually never got it to maturity because somebody would steal it, but uh, <laughs> but I could grow it and um, had a green thumb and uh, and so I talked to my sponsor, la la, thought about it and and a couple months later I got some seeds, you know, on AmsterdamSeeds.com and grew and made a greenhouse in my backyard and grew six plants and 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 that's out the limit, right? Yeah. You can only have six plants, or what is you the rule back then? Oh, okay. Yeah, and you could still have fifteen and. Uh, but uh, you know nobody grows; they just go to the store, right? <laughs> so. Uh, but uh, so I started growing my backyard and um, really enjoyed it. And I was able to go to the dispensary with my first crop. I got a, an ounce of weed off of each one, and I got $150 for each ounce, which was wholesale. You know, $10 a gram. Was, anyway, I was scared to death, went into some dispensary and sold it to them. And then I proved out that with a small shed in my backyard, I could make $48,000. And to pay for the therapy for my son, right? And so I started on this little adventure, you know, <laughs> I built a new shed in my backyard and doing this. Wait, and 15 or six plants netted $48,000? Oh, yes, yes. So you, 15 plants uh, grown properly, and, and uh, they grow, you know, it's a 12, it's an eight-week blooming cycle and four weeks in veg approximately, you know, to get them big enough. And so you get kind of grow them up a little bit, and then you... You change them into flower by changing the light cycle on them. You you uh -huh. tell the plant through the light cycle that it's September 21st, which is 12 hours a night and 12 hours a day. And it says, oh, my God, we got to get ready for winter. And it starts having buds, you know, and those buds are what is valuable and, and healthy and, and uh, you know, an herbal remedy given to us by whatever you believe in, you know. <laughs> Mother Nature <laughs> yeah, or you your go. fine, fine hand. Karma, the <laughs> yeah. uh, God, <laughs> these kind of things, you or know. Or proper fertilization. Well, you know, um, all you can do is be a good steward of that plant you can't you know the plant's gonna either do well or not right? so All you it's can not do is like tomatoes it where it has an end cycle and that you have to get a new plant you just continue with that single plant you could uh you could grow it uh, large and do what's called a mother which is what we do and then you make little plants out of it and you can I do see. the same thing with tomatoes and uh and so you you make all these little plants and it's a genetic exact copy of the mother and so I grow one strain, it's called Blue Dream, and I have a couple others uh, that are that I've had over seven and a half years that are genetic uh, duplicates of the ones that I started with. Oh, that's cool. Um, the first seeds that I, I lost that one, that was called Cheese. It was pretty good. I wish I would still have it, you know. So if you were yeah. to write, like, to Amsterdam.com, can you still get the same strain, or does it is it constantly well, ever evolving, or now are you the seed strain provider? <laughs> Every seed is like uh, an individual snowflake. So uh, marijuana or cannabis, uh, you know, or hemp, uh, actually all three are the same. Everything is hemp, 
A lot of people like to use these different words, you know, but everything is hemp. Hemp is cannabis sativa. Uh, there's just different uh, strains of it, you know, like Bing cherries and Rainier cherries and this kind of cherry and that. Maybe one's got a lot of vitamin C and one's got a lot of something else in it, right? Uh, but, uh, you know, and that's the way plants are. You know, you could, you could uh, probably breed a tomato to be uh, white if you wanted it, if you could probably breed all the red out of it if you wanted and that's what the difference between CBD and THC is, right? I and see. so a long time ago, and they outlawed hemp, I think, because it looks so much like it. It's exactly the same. That's right. why it looks like it, right? But, um, but anyway, uh, what was the next question? <laughs> <laughs> so you were saying that you got started because you were looking for not exactly. only some medical for yourself to, you know, uh, as you were going through your hep, hep C no, and that I actually only uh, I did never use marijuana for my hepatitis C. I just was able to get the green card to grow marijuana because oh, I, I had hepatitis C. Oh, but then you weren't really interested in taking it At for yourself. At the time, I was very concerned about my alcoholism more than Got my it. hepatitis, right? And so if I figured if I started smoking weed, I would like start getting thirsty, Got and it. I was, and then if I know for a fact because every Tuesday I get reminded of it when I go to my when you go to your meeting that if i drink i'm gonna die yeah and so uh it's you know that's just, so i was really careful and uh but i started growing it and i was able to do it and i found i was good at it and that most people didn't uh, sell their first crop most people couldn't buy a book on amazon for 24 dollars 99 and figure out how to grow weed and make it really nice like that most people can't do that and so and people would tell me that and i'm like yeah i don't know and i would just keep doing it because i really liked it yeah. And so when, you know, sometimes one of the questions, what would you tell a young person? I would say, find something that you're crazy passionate about and do that. Because I'm, I tell you, I'm crazy passionate about weed. I don't know why I am. And it just, I'm, it, and I like growing it. And the plant itself grows so fast. It's so wonderful. And then I t found out that I just really enjoy being a salesman. Yeah. Right. I, I like well, it's kind of it's kinda like know? fast results, right? Because yeah. you're saying like this growing cycle is just a short time, so you yeah, get to kind of see the the process, and you get to start and complete it. Yeah. And so you were doing this for a means to an end to mm -hmm. make some money for your kiddo who yep. had autism. So, so tell yep, me a good story. Therapy, did you, yeah. So you were able to get able yeah, to do so that. I got, so then I ran into this guy and he ended up being, um, you know, he's like, hey, look, we're going to be, you know, famous. We're going to take over the world, you know, and grow, you know, 10 zillion pounds of weed and blah, blah, blah. And I got caught up in, um, you know, they tell you that story. They say, you know, if you look around, you realize you're in the middle of a con and you look around and you don't see the mark. It's you. <laughs> and so that's what happened. I was like, the guy was just, I was a quote unquote investor, da 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 da. And I thought I was like starting a business. And and so the whole point okay, was. Okay, wait, back to, up, back up, back yeah, up. Okay, yeah. so you're growing these plants in, my in your backyard, in your blah. shed, that, and mm -hmm. from a book that you bought for $24.99. Yep. And so the, your, the next step was somebody came to you and I said, ran hey. to this guy and said, hey, let's make a business out of it. People are growing a lot of weed and selling it okay. to dispensaries, you know, like you're doing in a small way. And I thought, I mean, wow. are you really able yeah. to scale at that point? Because the laws are mm. such that you can only have this so, there so many was, plants. There right? was a gray area. Yeah. There was a gray area. And so, you know, look, think of it as if you were a little old lady and you needed some uh, uh, medical cannabis, but you can't grow. Like I said, it's not easy to do to right. get it to the medical level. You could throw some in your backyard, and but it's not medicinal quality. Right. And so to get it medicinal quality, you have to have be a skilled gardener, you know, and and so to, to do that. And so you should be compensated for your time and effort and the gas you spent and the soil and the newts and all that. And that was the idea behind the access point in the medical dispensary where a big gardener like me a professional gardener that started as a corporation in the very beginning and everything could come in and bring cannabis to them and then other people would access it right, right. at the at the access point and they would give them money and they would give me some of that money for growing it right and what i would do is i would take copies of all their medical cards and i would take it to my grow and i'd stick it on the wall and i had a big book of them like this and some attorney somewhere said i can defend it and we never had to test that because they legalized it, right? But the attorney said, look, you can theoretically grow a gazillion plants. And medically, at state level, you're... Oh, you're so you're, you were thinking, I can grow 15 plants per person, per person. One, per 15 person, per, for that it, one. Got it, got and it, got you it, would it, grow okay. it for all of them because yeah. in the law, it stated you could pay somebody else to grow your weed for you. Got right? it. Right? And, and so there was all, you know, it was an incomplete law. What's her name? Dixie something or other, the, mayor, the, the governor? Dixie Lee Ray. She redlined, vetoed it. Yeah. 
Dixie the Race. So it was a really nice law. It had all kinds of cool stuff in it, just like Colorado. And then she redlined it because she was worried that the state employees were going to be Wait, handling Dixie drug Lee money. Dixie Lee was like way back in the day. I must have been Christine Gray. Medical's been around a oh, long really? time. Oh, really? You're oh. right. It was Christine Gray. Okay. You're right. Uh, but she, <laughs> yeah, I'm old Dixie Lee <laughs> So I was uh, like, I know. I'm so no old. Yeah, yeah, let's watch Star Trek together. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so, uh, but she redlined it because she was worried about the government employees laundering money. Oh. And so, you know, that they would get in trouble for, you know, and all this. And so then the, the next guy, Jay, or, or the next governor, Ben, he said, oh, we're cool. And then, and. You and, mean our current governor, yeah. Jay Inslee? <laughs> You're killing me right now. <laughs> but I, I want to know more. I'm trying to be political right now. But, but I, don't I really want to know. Hold yeah. on, hold on. I mean, I guess I didn't know that there was a difference between medicinal quality and something that is some just. Some booty. Some. <laughs> Whatever. Yeah. yeah. So, so what is the difference between so something somebody grows in as a house plant uh, so versus look, you're trying you're trying to do something about pain yeah. or cancer or something like that. And you need a certain amount of cannabinoids, you know, because you hear somebody say, well, it's 20 percent. Right. Um, something you grow in your backyard might be, you know, a few percentage or whatever, if you could even smoke it. And then maybe you could prepare it. Maybe you could cook it up in a pot with some butter and do this, that, and the other. But you would have to study on it and things like that. And and so uh, when somebody makes it into a concentrated form or a concentrated, like I said, where a bud like this would have 20% by weight THC in it instead of 3 or 4%. How do you measure it? It's a third-party lab. Oh, uh, we okay. use Confidence Analytics in Redmond, Washington. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, I, I have to backtrack you because yeah. I want to know what pot butter is. Well, is you just take a bunch of pot, throw it in the butter. and uh, Like regular butter? Yeah, and then cook it. Not vegan. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, a, any kind of oil because uh, the cannabinoids are, um, are uh, they just, they're, they're carrying fat. They're born in fat. So they'll... They'll uh, even in the, in your body they store in the fat cells, right? Oh, and so um, that's why you could smoke some and then and then test positive some days later because it's it's going right, around right, in your right. fat okay, cells. Right, right, right. Okay, I knew that. Yeah, yeah. So uh, you want it in some fat to help it uh, be distributed. So that's why butter is so nice. Oils are good. We sell a product right now mixed into MCT uh, oil, which is refined coconut oil. Um, you know, for a topical. Is that supposed? Right? Oh. It's not yeah. keto yeah. so you <laughs> said that you were <laughs> right so yeah, you were yeah, saying that this totally person horrible. came up to you and then you you met him and that I you went caught, in to invest i just caught the fire yeah i just started a company a corporation called podworks corp and back then it was Works. pod the thing was a room that you were growing weed in we called pods you know, okay, pod. pod works, not yeah, pod so, works. Yeah, pod works, okay, right? Okay. And then, you know, when you went to the bank, you told them you were a landscaper, right? <laughs> 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 because, you, you know, you need to pay taxes. And, you know, your payroll taxes uh, going to the feds, they only want to take it out of a bank account, right? And right. So if you don't have a bank account, even if you're trying to be a legit business here in Washington State, you know, uh, you sort of have to say, hey, you know. And then what happened was when 502 came along and I was on the Internet as a weed... Then I lost my bank account, okay. lot, you know, and then you have to have a special bank account with, uh, you know, credit union or somebody. So now you can yeah. actually have a bank account, yes. oh, but only with a credit union. With uh, Salal Credit Union. Oh, the one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Salal's cool. And uh, Sound Credit Union as well. They're cool, too. Okay. okay. And I hear of other people is Timberland and there's one more, or uh, Obi. Got it. Yeah. So, you know, you don't get all the services. Bank of America, I sure do miss it, right? I just miss Bank of America. When I first got going, uh, I stuck $1.8 million in the ATM down by my house. <laughs> Stuffed it in there. It was so wonderful <laughs> stuffing that money in there. At the end of the day, you know, it was just so wonderful. And um, I mean, it sounds <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> and they used to, I don't know, swipe in credit cards, you know, I mean, I mean like a I'm, regular I business. Mean, not right? a red flag at, at no, all. But like a regular business. Regular business comes with their receipts at the end of the day, right? Uh, 1.8 million. Place. Yeah. Well, you know, the bar down the way, the liquid lime, they did a lot more business than me on, on just on pull tabs. Oh, yeah, okay. She's I'm in the wrong doing 10 yeah. million. Uh, yeah, she's doing, yeah, people are giving her money. Here you go, have some money. And uh, gambling is, oh. My okay, God. well, let's anyway. not jump down that no, road. No, no. So tell me, yeah, <laughs> tell me about this investor guy that sounds so, like he kind of took advantage yeah, of Yeah, I caught the fire and uh, he just wanted to, and he said, well, I know all how to do it and everything, but he didn't. And, um, 
all he really wanted to do was be a partner and have access to the bank account, you know. Sure. And, okay. You know. And so anyway. So how'd you get um, rid of him? Uh, I fired him. Oh, okay. <laughs> but there was some, uh, you know, because it was, uh, you know, I was on the paper. He had to get, you know, some money. We went through med mediation. I remember uh, when we were mediating, the lady that was doing it, you know, and uh, it was here in Everett over at uh, some title company or something. And she goes, and he, we take a break, and or he goes out of the room, and she goes, oh, you poor man. Because, <laughs> <laughs> you know, this dude just had his hooks in. But uh, it was $70,000. Right, oh. and so I started the business with everything I had, right? Let's plus my credit. So, uh, so there's at the time it was my 401k and what have you. It was about three hundred thirty thousand dollars, and then I had credit and a little and some property to do it on, and da-da. so it was close. I mean, the the plane was headed towards the mountain, and uh, then I got rid of him and a couple employees that were his, you know, and then we made it to harvest and we cropped and we were able to and you know. Sort of the rest is history because we're a perpetual harvest, and you know you have. And then I learned about things like cash flow, right? Right. <laughs> I was like, why do they call it cash flow? And um, so when yeah, you uh, so tell me, describe to me this the the journey of going from your backyard grow mm -hmm. to what does it look like now? Is it a warehouse? Is yes, it yes? Um, so it went from the backyard, and then I bought. I had a piece of property out in Arlington, and we started using that. And also, I bought another piece of property in Arlington that had like a four thousand square foot shop on it. And so then we we built that out, and I put a hundred lights in there, and we were growing in there with a, with a hundred lights. And then I started building the greenhouse, right? And then um, right when we were really kind of getting going out in the greenhouse, and this you know, and during this time from medical to five hundred two to the legal. That was the 502 was in the greenhouse, and uh, Snohomish County had passed uh, planning ordinances, and they said the R5 was was uh, you know permitted use that you could be a producer processor, blah blah blah. And so I put all this money in, and then um, some uh, there was 85 licenses in the Snohomish County R5, right? And so some people, and I know up at uh, Wagner or something, there was a housing development up in Monroe, and really upset some folks when a guy moved in up there and and started building the greenhouse and growing weed and they were all you know i would say you know straight laced yeah and and <laughs> and so they're like oh my god and then we went through this horrible debacle of testimony and all this and pregnant ladies with little children and crying what about the children and some guys <laughs> saying that there was going to be 45 caliber emplacements on every corner you know and you know with the drug runners and i mean and it's like and, you know, you get up and go, dude, we've been growing weed here in Snohomish County. Why do you think there's so many Because I always thought Arlington was pretty, like, oh. Uh, like oh, yeah. pretty open to it, right? I mean. Well, everybody knows, you know, that Arlington is just, you know, and the, and the mayor of Arlington, that's the thing. 58% of her constituents voted for it, right? And so she took it seriously. My voters tell you, hey, we want marijuana. And so she put out planning and all this for it, right? So did Snohomish County. But yeah. then there was this huge stink and, and they buckled. Okay. Right. And, okay. and so and th we didn't have a political I didn't have Joshie working for me you know, <laughs> and we didn't have a political horse in the game and we lost. OK. And, and I was, you know, a small business. I was just getting going and then wham, you know, I mean, I probably lost a million bucks that day. And, and that was about all I had, you know. <laughs> so what'd you do? <laughs> well, we kept going and um, and then we're looking for a warehouse. We got a broker and we found a warehouse in town and found out that the mayor is in, in town was was nice. You the know? mayor of Everett. That's right. Mayor. Um, What's her name? <laughs> Come on, Joshie. Tolbert. Yeah, Mayor Barbara Tolbert. Yeah, that's in right. In Arlington? Yeah, Barbara Tolbert. There yeah, we go. okay. Yeah, thanks, Barb. I wasn't sure yeah, if you're still in Everett yeah, or Arlington. Yeah, okay. Yeah, <laughs> cut the pause on it. Yeah, so, uh, but yeah, Barbara's really She's cool. She's very nice. Yeah, yeah. She, and that's the thing. All we ever asked for was be treated like a regular business, right? Right, right. It's not that, you know, that people wouldn't... Um, discriminate against us you know and not let us you know do business like a, you know a guy look you know um budweiser's not getting discriminated against you know seagram seven or whatever you know we would just even just ask parody with hard liquor and alcohol but we don't even get that you know because of the past and you know and the propaganda saying that we're just as bad as heroin or something like this you know and anybody even obama said that marijuana is safer than alcohol, right? And and 
But know. it's a perception issue because I know from my point of view, I've always heard that it was bad. And mm-hmm. so when it got legalized, I had to do a complete shift in what my biases were. And yeah. um, and I've struggled with it. And then changing even how I advocate for it now as an entrepreneur, mm-hmm. um, an economic development professional. Um, how do I help businesses like yours when I had to really kind of change my perception? Yeah. And so I'm sure that you're like just in the crux of of that. It's a matter of education. For because sure. Because what they were told, um, you know, uh, back in 1972 or somewhere in there, uh, Nick Nixon, uh, this hat's making me hot. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Nixon did a survey or a study. He was trying to find something really bad with marijuana, right? And um, so he had all this team of scientists. They did this big study. And they couldn't really find a whole lot wrong with it. What they did find was a lot of stuff that was right about it, right? That it did have medicinal qualities and that it did fight cancer and it did it <laughs> cause, you know, to right, help right, with right. pain and nausea and glaucoma and God knows and epilepsy and who knows. The list goes on and on. Right. They just never studied it. And they came with that and he said, oh, my God, you know. And so he changed it to to be negative and then you saw the big dare to keep you know and all the propaganda and said it's a gateway and all this and i know from personal experience yes it is a gateway it's a gateway coming the other way it's a gateway off of oxycontin it's a gateway off of heroin right Mm. you know i personally delivered when i first started uh i might have left that part out but i delivered do medicinal delivery to houses you know people with medical cards right and i would go to their house and and Many people with back injuries and other things, they were messed up and, and were trying to get off pain pills. Yeah. And even just recently, a few weeks ago, uh, with CBD, um, somebody's trying to get off of Oxycontin. You know, a 90-something-year-old World War yeah. II veteran. This thing, he's like, can I get a World War II veteran discount? I said, of course you can. Yes, you thank know? you for your service. Two for one, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, but, yeah. So you... Um, Got your space in in Arlington, mm-hmm. and then what did business look like then? Well, then we had to build it out, and uh, and then we had to get the LCB to let us move, and then we had to move, you know, ten thousand plants. We had to rent out a bunch of vans. Took two days, and, and LCB as in liquor and cannabis liquor board. Liquor and cannabis okay. board, yeah. And uh, and then we got to to work in in Arlington. Okay. And, uh, and you know, we've been at the same location now over three years. Uh, we closed on it. The mortgage that I got on that warehouse was the first of its kind, as far as I know, in Washington State. Uh, there's other people that got mortgages, you know, to to do business, uh, marijuana business. But I was a weed company taking weed money to buy a building to grow weed in. <laughs> okay. And so the the, the federal regulator uh, for banking uh, talked to the president of Solal Credit Union uh, about me personally. Oh, okay. And, uh, in a good way? <laughs> yeah, yeah. He okay. said, well, you know, I don't know. And... Uh, and I was doing medical, and medical was over uh, June 30th, 2016. It was, was over, right? And right. so I had to wait until he said, well, I'd rather if we close on, you know, after July 1st. Okay. And so we closed on July 15th. So what is the difference between medicinal, the medicinal laws and 502? The medicinal laws were, um, were incomplete. Oh, I see. There was, no, I don't see. What? Uh, well, there was no required testing, required uh, traceability, the traceability seed to sale, you know, if you start a plant, you know, you have a tag on it and it goes all the way through and then harvested and all that. Okay, so if you have a, p- a plant, mm-hmm. you have to tra- track that plant. It's got a little barcode on it. Yep. And you have to track it all the way through its life, la, 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 and all the way until it's harvested and then hung up on a, on a line, right? And then off to the trimmer and trimmed up. And, and into the jar and off to the retailer. It's still it's still being tracked and off to the retailer. And then you beep and then you buy it and, psh, well, oh, and then we don't know where it goes anymore. <laughs> Especially if you paid cash. <laughs> okay, but, so uh, why all the process if they don't even know what happened to it after its sale? Or well, is that the sales? Well, you don't know what happens to an apple after you sell it either. I mean, somebody eats it, right? Okay. Um, yeah. So the seed to sale is so that nothing goes out the side. Okay. Right. So if you're, you know, you give somebody a license to grow and then they're growing and then maybe they're going to take a pound and sell it to their friend Johnny. And then Johnny goes down to Linwood High School or Mount Lake Terrace, right? And sells it, you know. Not a Mount Lake Terrace. Yeah, yeah. Go Hawks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't sell weed down there. Exactly. Yeah. And so you see what I'm saying? So it, pre- it prevents it from going out into uh, the minor. Two things they're really worried about, and they should be, you know, is uh, keep away from minors and uh, they should get their taxes, right? So if yeah. it's not sold in the retail store, they're not getting their 37%. 
Okay, so 37% is what it goes. Okay. Yes. And so, you know, uh, and so those are the two things I'm worried about. But they get really excessive on it with cameras. Uh, Like I probably have, you know, I'm running maybe um, uh, 10,000 square feet of bench, you know, growing plants. And I probably have at least a quarter million dollars worth of uh, closed circuit cameras. Yeah, I had a friend that was doing uh, closed circuit um, security work. And he was telling me the amount of work that he was doing. I was just like the mind blown. It's ridiculous. You know, and the the guy saying, oh, I got to see the gardener's feet. You know, so head, hands, and feet, he says. So just seeing his feet, he came in and, and jacked me up. That's why they had that law last year. I call it Joey's Law. And hey, Joey. And, uh, uh, and uh, <laughs> who's Joey? <laughs> Joey was the cop that jacked me up. Yeah. Oh, and okay. uh, he's just like, <laughs> you know, and and he says, uh, I want to see everybody's feet. And well, seeing everybody's feet cost me $75,000. Okay, right? so there's actually somebody watching the security cameras? No, nope. And they didn't ever check them. Okay. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> they just have to be there. You have to have 45 days in case they want to come and look at okay. Johnny Gardner's feet, you know, 43 days ago back in the corner. What was All he right. doing with his toes, you know? And um, But it should be, you know, the reality should be is that it should be like a bank where the key points, you know, because e- even at a bank, you don't see the teller's feet. Right. right? And, right. and, um, and it know, really is up to you. It seems like as the owner of, of your course, business to my product, be, I don't want to lose it. Exactly. Yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, it's silly to think that I'm not going to safeguard against that. Exactly. And that I don't know as a what's business going man. Bus- yeah. Yeah. And so then what happens is, uh, like, could you imagine, say you're a brewer and you're making beer and, you know, and the, and the beer meister goes over with the scoop, like they have on the commercial. Oh yes. You know, and he's tasting it and everything. And, and that's a violation, right? right. I can't, sample my own product right according to the law right can't one get high gram, in your own supply one gram per month one gram per month because and it's not for any other reason except for them not getting their taxes at the retail establishment for the 37 even my purchases right oh you have to purchase your own product yeah that's what they're saying right oh, you know, know theoretically right oh you know so when did top weed. shelf what are you talking about? <laughs> so and, when uh, did top <laughs> shelf come into so you've got your uh th- you've got your do you yeah. call it a grow? Do you call yeah. it what is the? Well, you're you're theory, you're a producer processor. Okay, producer yeah. processor. So producer is the grower, and processor is the packaging, the trimming, the everything like this, right? And so you've got your product, or uh, you you're growing and you're processing, and then you move into you want to make a CBD product, right. or is that is that the natural? Well, uh, yeah, I mean. When, when they legalized uh, hemp, you know, in the farm bill, I, I went right out and started a new company, <laughs> Top Shelf CBD. And um, so that way it separates it because uh, you see um, there's uh, they have this thing in the IRS code. It's called 280E. And so if uh, you're breaking the law, and so according to the federal government, I'm trafficking a Schedule One narcotic, right? And so um, I'm, I'm uh, making money in a felonious manner. And so uh, they don't mind you doing that. They just want uh, to get their taxes on it. And they also don't let you write off your expenses when you're breaking the law. Let's move to the journey of where Top Shelf came from. So you are... So you Top Shelf was originally the, the Pelican case delivering to the medical uh, you know, patients, right? So we had the Podworks was the, was the grow arm, was the producer in the original terms, I guess. And Top Shelf was the was the sales uh, piece of that, you know, in the processor. And so um, as it developed and we got into 502, then we developed the logo and, um, you know, and the rest of it. We didn't brand our, our products in, in medical. Right? Oh, I see. You just sold it in a big bag and the retailers, they doled it out like, you know, bulk products. But we found uh, after 502 and we, and we had to brand it, and I had the top shelf was already in existence, and um, the concept and the idea and everything like this and the name. Uh, and so we just moved in and then we started putting it. And it found that because of my personality and my, you know, my really, my need for quality, and, you know, and I really want it to be good, you know, I guess some people call it, you know, <laughs> just crazy. And, uh, but that came out in the product, right? And it developed into a brand, right? And I didn't know anything about branding or brand or what it is. And it developed into a brand. And so, uh, and now, you know, years, years later, it's, you know, it represents and people trust me. You know, the thing is, is that, you know, I have a, uh, a pint glass. Uh, originally, I, I had a shot glass. And, uh, okay, know. so your product is a CBD oil? No, my product is a, uh, is 
flower is marijuana, right? Okay. Cannabis. And so, uh, and it comes in a jar, glass, good quality cannabis is always packaged in glass. Bags are for booty. <laughs> <laughs> and bags so, are for booty. <laughs> yeah, the bag salesman, they hate it when I say that. But uh, so, and so I needed to put it in glass. And we had these little pickle jars and stuff in the beginning. And one day I was, I was weighing up some weed and uh, um, there was a souvenir shot glass on the counter. And I had a, uh, I use these toaster tongs, you know, bamboo toaster. And I'm pulling it out. I had a bud right in the tongs. And I was like, wow. And I dropped it in there. And I was like, oh, and it just fit, just, you know, oh. And I, and I said, wow. And I pulled that out. And I said, and, and I weighed it. And I remember it was 2.03 grams. And it, two grams in, in, in slang is called a dub, right? And so I said, it's a dub. It's Wait. a shot. It's a dub shot, right? And I was like, oh. I like this, and I got this little lid out of the cupboard. I stuck it on there, and I put out my business card, and I stuck my logo on there with a little tape, and I took a picture, and I was like, oh, and two weeks later, we we're selling them, right? And then I found out, and I put in the lid on a shot glass, two grams, you know, and they're selling for 20 bucks, you know, at the store, and la di da yippee, yippee. And I get this call and it's from the glass guy, and he says, hey, you know, Johnny down here in Long Beach, he's calling me up. He wants to buy shot glasses. He wants lids. He wants to hand her. And I said, and I had this word dub shot trademarked, right? But oh, nice. that doesn't protect the glass and the shape and everything like this. And I said, oh, my God. And so I call up my attorney. I said, what do I do? What do I, you know? He goes, well, I don't know. Let me, we're going to go talk about it for a minute. And, uh, of course, you know, that was $650. And he comes back and he says, all right. He says, we could try patenting it, right? And I said, oh. And he goes, well, you know, it's not good about it. And I said, well, let's give it a shot, right? And so... Then I start telling everybody, it's patent pending, patent pending. Don't you dare, patent pending, I'll sue you. And um, because you can't protect any intellectual property uh, in marijuana. You know, everybody copies you anyway, but especially it seems like in marijuana because the, it's illegal, right? Remember the taxes, and yeah. so you don't have yeah. any protection whatsoever. But I was able to package, uh, to get a, a, a patent. It's called, uh, it's a design patent. It's called nice. um, ornamental, ornamental packaging, right? Okay. And it's dried flowers inside, right? So I have two U.S. patents, one for a pint glass. Then I got a pint glass, and I, so I, I sell an ounce in a pint glass. Okay, two, so three. if one's a dub shot, what's the pint? It's called a pounder. <laughs> 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 it's the top shelf pounder. And I got one for a half ounce I'm working on. It's called the half pint. Okay. And, uh, and the, then I got one that holds four grams. That one's patent pending, by the way. It's coming back. And nice. it's a double dub. Right and the double dub and the thing was it's just the lid the the Tupperware lid on the, on a on a glass nobody ever thought of it believe it or not nobody thought of it. I talked to a guy who'd been in packaging five years nobody he said I'd never seen it I was like you know right. I, I feel kind of silly but hey and so when you look at the patent and it says in the line it says inventor it says Thomas Worthy hey, what's there up there you yeah. go <laughs> and we also have it in Canada and the European Union but Great. I don't know that I'll ever do business there um, but. Like I said uh, in the break, you know, um, I'm from Snohomish County, uh, born and raised. And, um, you know, I went to Linwood High School, went to Aldwood Junior High. I went to Martha Lake Elementary, right? And, and to have the bands here in, in, in the anti-capitalism, the anti-free trade, mm -hmm. you know, I understand the reasons for it. But like I said, the reasons are... 50 years old and not really uh, real. They were made so up in the first place, right? So what do you what do you see? What do you need for the future? What well, are you looking at? Well, we're going to try to do, I guess, more of this. Uh, Josh is going to have us out, and we're going to have some tours at the place. We're going to try to educate some folks in, in Snohomish County to open up uh, the areas that are, have bands like Marysville, Snohomish, Monroe, Linwood. As a matter of fact, Linwood has a band. And so there's that uh, as far as uh, a side work. And, and as far as me, we're just going to continue to grow. Uh, we're growing. Uh, the business grows. At a f last year, we sold $7.3 in wholesale products, which was about $25 million on the retail shelves in 2018 of top shelf products. Wow. And so, uh, and, you know, and you think about 37% uh, of that went to the state, right? So top shelf, me personally, helped uh, raise up 37% of 25 million for yeah. the state. Thank you very much. Yeah, right? thank you. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, that's what it can do, right? From people right here in Arlington and in Snohomish County, you know, and in Everett and places around like this are getting taxes and, and actually making the community safer. You know, so we're going to work on that. Um, you know, I did 7.3. I'm going to do 8 to 9 this year. 
you know, and if and as the prices are coming up, because they are, because of more of this free market that we're talking about, and the good players get a win, right? If you work hard and and do good, just like your mother tells you, then you get to succeed, right? The only thing that blocks that usually is when people are controlling things. You don't let the cash flow, right? Yeah. You don't let the customer and the American, you know, go to the store and get what he needs, you know. Uh, you you control that. You don't allow competition. You know, competition is what keeps prices low and quality high. You know, and this is what we need is competition. Nice. We can't have, you know. And so we're going to work on that. We're going to develop CBD um, in my new company. Uh, that property that got taken away from me um, by all the people with the pitchforks and the torches and the crazy, you know, and the, you know, uh, oh, what about the children? Well, it's, I've got to wrap it up. I am really excited to get to talk to you. I, 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 um, you educated me a lot on what the process is. I totally didn't know, and I appreciate being so open and sharing it. You're oh. funny as hell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, we hope that, uh, that we did, you know, educate. But the some. thing is, is yeah. I see you as, um, th as entertaining you are, as you are, I do see you as a businessman mm -hmm. and somebody who cares about his product and looks at it as a business. And yeah. from my perspective, I really appreciate that. So nice to talk with you. Thank you so much. Lot, All right. Take All right. care. Take it easy. Well, that was fun. I told you a little off the rails, but a fascinating look at the cannabis industry that this community and I mean, let's face it, that the U.S. is really beginning to navigate through. Be sure to check out the Eat, Stay, Love Snow Co. blog to see the pictures and behind the scenes at www.eatstaylovesnowco.com and for a link to the Top Shelf Cannabis. A uh, big special thanks to Dan Cardenas from Baker Belt Works for the AV and technical expertise. And remember to subscribe to hear more great conversations from the awesome people of this community. Peace until next time. Thanks for listening. I appreciate it. Take care. Thank <laughs> you.